It's a case study. It's about the University of Manchester um, from kind of from 2004 onwards, but, but I'll, I'll say a bit more about the background to the institution. I'm forbidden by Ricky to speak about libraries, so I will try very hard not to. <laughs> it is an interesting case study. Um, it started before I joined the, the university, um, and it's a success story almost. So I will just say, Luke Georgiou, Professor Luke Georgiou, who um, would love to have been here, was unable to make it, but I have drawn quite heavily on the things he has said, because he has quite strong views about all of this, and also the things he has published. So uh, as all librarians do, at the end of the slides, I will give you a list of references to take away with you. To start by saying something about Manchester, um, I want to give a flavour of Manchester without go going to taking too much time on it. Um, Manchester, we regard as Britain's second city. There are other contenders, but that's my position. Um, uh, it's, been, it's been also named Mad Madchester. Uh, if you know the Happy Mondays, this is where I think of Peter's reference to have I calibrated the audience, you know. Um, Happy Mondays is a Manchester band, and they uh, renamed the city Madchester. It's... Um, it's up in the north, although on that map it looks quite, quite southern, but it, we regard it as in the north of Britain. It's a very um, lively city. Its history is very much steeped in the Industrial Revolution. It was the, um, the world's first industrial city, and with that went the, the saying that what Manchester does first, the world does... To, sorry, what Manchester does today, the world does tomorrow. And the university, as you might expect, has grabbed hold of that statement. Um, the, the history was based around, um, or the economy was based around cotton, cottonopolis, and Manchester had the first uh, industrial estate in the world. There are many claims to fame, but uh, that's one of them. The first canal, the first uh, industrial waterway, and the, the world's first computer, might surprise you to know. Ernest Rutherford split the atom in Manchester at the university. And more recently, it's the home of graphene, which I'll say more about. The people of Manchester are very friendly and open. I can't claim to be one. I would have a different accent if I, if I were. And, uh, but it's also um, a great nightclub scene and, and has produced a very high proportion of, of bands, of music groups. Um, I, I'm reluctant to test the audience on, on whether you've heard of the Hollies, the Hermans Hermits, 10CC, Sad Cafe, the Buzzcocks, Joy Division, Elbow, more recently Elbow, and so on. Um, Manchester is said to have everything except a beach. <laughs> but it's, it's kind of difficult. But um, I was struck by what Peter said about being in Illinois, being in Urbana-Champaign. There are many distractions for students in Manchester, and the city council even bring a beach in the summer and put it along the side of the canal. <laughs> so really we claim that Manchester is a place where things are done differently. We do things differently here. The university, I need to say something briefly about the university. It would be very strange not to give you that context. We are in the Russell Group. You've heard references to that today. We are the largest university in the UK. We have 40,000 students, um, 10,000 international students, the largest proportion of international students in the UK in any university. Our turnover is around 900 million pounds. It doesn't go so far here. Um, and there's a lot of talk at Manchester all the time about what makes us distinctive. And, of course, everybody talks about their research profile and, and what they do for their students and their student experience. But at Manchester... We pride ourselves on our contribution to society, that we produce graduates who are expected to be able to lead in society, but, but at the other end of the spectrum, we also uh, try to make a difference in terms of social impact. We employ a large number of people from the local community, and we have a very high number, that, again, the highest in the UK, the high number of um, students, undergraduate students, from underprivileged neighbourhoods. I've sneaked in a library slide. I'll move on. Actually, I put this in because the big box in the middle, the modern-looking box, is actually 
um, the Alan Gilbert Learning Commons. And it was actually Alan Gilbert who set out the vision for this university um, when it was, uh, well, when, when it was created, and I'll say more about that. He sadly died before, uh, or just, just at the time of his retirement. So we have named our digital library, which is that white box, the uh, Alan Gilbert Learning Commons. It's entirely digital, and the students love it. So moving on now to talk about the, the university from 2004. My point here is that if you can see the logo, and you probably can't, the 1824 that is referred to in that logo rather disguises, it's a, it's a display of pedigree, if you like, that disguises the fact that the university I'm talking to you about today was founded in October, October the 1st, 2004, by Royal Charter as a result of a merger of two universities in Manchester, the Victoria University and UMIST, which is the Science and Technology University of Manchester. So there are, there are many reasons for that merger. Um, the increasing complex, complexity of research problems were demanding interdisciplinarity and critical mass and scale that we now feel we benefit very much from. The increasing importance of the knowledge economy and recognizing the role of universities as a contributor to business and the community. Student fees, still quite a new feature of higher education in the UK, and an emph a growing emphasis on quality as a result of those. And the globalization of higher education in the UK at that time, competition for students, uh, competition over research funding, and of course, limited resources. So the rationale for that merger is all there, but more specifically, the shape of the UK economy, if you're not aware of it, it's rather uninodal. I love that word, uninodal. Um, it's based, it's centered very much around London and the Southeast. We talk about the Golden Triangle being London, Oxford, and Cambridge. And fairly historically, Manchester and, of course, all the other northern cities with northern universities have fallen outside of that triangle and suffered as a result. So this was Manchester, through the vision of Alan Gilbert, the president at the time, this was Manchester's attempt to stride out and set itself apart from, from the rest, not to, not to emulate the Golden Triangle, but to, to compete and to do something different. So you'll see on this slide, there's a, a, a chunk of quote in the middle, and it's about making the University of Manchester, and then in brackets, but very importantly, already an internationally distinguished center of research, innovation, learning, and scholarly inquiry, one of the leading universities in the world by 2015. And here we are in 2015. So you want to know what happened, I hope. So the 2015 agenda, and that is very much what this strategy, this strategic vision became identified as in the new university in 2004. Um, as a process, the merger was probably exemplary. Again, it was before I arrived, but I arrived soon after, and I hardly noticed that a merger had happened, in fact. The new challenge, though, for this institution has been the effort needed to create a world-class university on a new model, as I've said, not emulating those of, of, of the past. Um, the Ivy League, well, how could we, really? So I think the university has been unusual in having a, a published strategy. It's up on the web, that's not unusual. What is unusual, I think, is that we have been very bold and specific about our KPIs. Um, they, we knew they were stretching, and um, what I want to talk to you about is the, is the journey and, and where we have got to now that we are in, in 2015. So um, just to, to touch briefly on the goals, the, these, these are the high-level goals within that strategy. Um, there's one around global standing, so that's reputation, it's brand, and it's the, the, the indicator around that is to be recognized as one of the top 25 leading universities in the world as measured by position in international league tables, tables that measure elements of research, teaching, reputation, and global reach. And that's, that's the big, the holy grail, if you like. That's where we set our, 
pastoral. Secondly, world-class world research, so homing in specifically on research to be one of the top 25 research universities in the world according to commonly accepted criteria. And you would expect that those would be around uh, internationally leading researchers and uh, their ability to produce research of significance and impact. And we've talked a lot about that already today and, and those of you who were here yesterday. So in the Shanghai Jiao Tong academic uh, world rankings. Um, our aspiration is to be in the top 25. Uh, you'll know that that table actually is, is the top 500. And the measures that go with that um, are around staff and alumni and the number of Nobel Prizes that, that they have, the numbers of highly cited staff, total publications, publications in nature and science still, and per capita performance in res with respect to size of institution. I want to say at this point, because it is 2015, um, although we were very bold in saying that this was our aspiration for 2015 back in 2004, we never saw that as an end in itself. It's a goal, it's a stretch, a stretch target for the institution, and it's a journey, of course. Then, the other two goals I, won't, I don't want to take too much time on. Um, the one that you'd expect there around um, learning and student experience, it's about, um, for us, it's about being able to provide a superb higher education and learning experience to outstanding students, irrespective of their backgrounds. And that's, that's key to Manchester, irrespective of their backgrounds. Produce graduates distinguished in their intellectual capabilities employability, so we have a big emphasis on will they be employable at the end of this, their leadership qualities and their ability and ambition to contribute to society. That is what a Manchester graduate is, in our view. And then moving on to the fourth goal, social responsibility, the university will contribute to the social and economic impact of the country, the locality, the country and, and the world. So, achievements in terms of world rankings is what I want to talk about next. There was an immediate beneficial impact of this merger that I've just told you about. So, almost overnight, from 2004, uh, when the Victoria University of Manchester, which was the, the larger of the two partners, um, was at 78th position in the Shanghai Jiao Tong Index, uh, Shanghai Shanghai Jiao Tong League table, um, we moved to 53rd overnight as a result of that because actually that ranking favours scale, as, as you may know. We made more rapid progress in the following years to 2011 and then it got a bit harder because we were getting closer to the, um, the elite, I suppose, putting it simply. So incremental changes um, since 2008 have brought us to 38th position. So we're not at 25th, but we're moving in the right direction. So since that merger, we have moved up 40 places. And in the European, if you take out the European universities, we are now at sixth position. Uh, that was the position last year. There is a downside to this that I thought I'd share with you. One is that the, the, the very focused effort of the university on achieving the research goal and the reputational goal did mean that we took our eye off the ball in terms of our student experience. So this is a big university, 40,000 students nearly, and we have had to put in a big push to uh, make our students really feel that they are valued at Manchester. So when I arrived in 2008, that was where we were at. It was a really important goal for us to boost the the resources and the focus, the effort on the student experience. The other downside of all of this was we spent a lot of money and we ended up in quite a big deficit. Um, just as I arrived, unfortunately. That's really bad news. This is just a graph to show you um, progress since that merger in 2004. You'll see steep, steep increase and then it starts to plateau, and that's where we are now.
Another dimension of international ranking, of course, is, um, is to do with iconic appointments. And again, we've, we've heard mention of, of this already this morning. The, the university um, set out to attract as many Nobel laureates or potential Nobel laureates as it could. Um, in the UK, we have the largest number associated with, with the university at 25. Um, and in 2010, I think it was, um, we, two of our physicists got the Nobel Prize for, for physics, Andre Gaiman, Konstantin, or Kostya Novoselev, for the isolation, it's called, not the discovery, but the isolation of graphene. So that gave the institution a huge boost, as you can imagine. We had big celebrations, and, uh, and it made a difference to our, um, our rankings. We're still open to iconic appointments, I should say, but actually our focus is increasingly on attracting world-leading minds um, and developing and supporting those, those people. It's probably cheaper. Okay. In terms of research awards, research income has been another area of, of spectacular growth. And these, these lines, so the, the, the line that stops short is, is the current one. And... Uh, these include knowledge transfer, uh, grants from knowledge transfer from industry, um, from charities, from the European Union. It excludes the big money that we get from, from government as a result of our research rankings, which I'll, I'll come on to. So here we are in 2015. We are a, a university uh, covering all disciplines, very broad-based, and we have comprehensive research excellence across interdisciplinary teams. And that's also a challenge, interdisciplinarity. I think Peter didn't particularly touch on this, but interdisciplinarity brings its own challenges in terms of uh, the rankings, because they are still very much wedded to um, single-subject single, single subject approaches. We're driven by this explicit strategy, and you'll see now that the third bullet tells us that we have shifted our aspiration from 2015, because we're here, and we now say that we will be in the world, world's top 25 by 2020. We're not embarrassed by that. We knew it was going to happen you know, well before 2015, um, so we can all watch this space. Um, but, but everyone is working very hard. And I'll say a bit more at the end of my presentation about some of the changes we've made to help that to happen. And we've slightly changed some of our goals. So we, we, will, we, we aim to double our research grant based on the 2010 figure, improve the quality of our research outputs, and that comes back to the national league tables and the REF, which we've touched on, and I'll say more about that. And also, uh, we've set ourselves a goal about increasing the amount of revenue from commercialized IP. Um, actually, before I move on, I will just say on that, um, improving the quality of our research, because after all, that's why we're here, um, the most recent indicator that we have set ourselves is to improve the quality of research outputs, ensuring that 90% of staff, that's faculty, are judged as producing world-leading or internationally excellent research by peer review through the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, and to ensure that the share of our publications falling into the top 10% of cited papers in their field matches or exceeds that for the top five institutions. That's our, that's our new goal around research. So at this point, I wanted to say something about those international research rankings. Ricky believes it's really good for us all to know more about this, and so I'm going to talk to you um, about, in, in some detail, not too much, I hope, um, but uh, it, it's really, it goes into a bit more detail around um, the importance of these rankings, in, particularly in the UK context. We have decided to move away from just focusing our attention, this is at Manchester, focusing our attention on the um, Shanghai Zhao Tong League table. And we believe that a basket of indicators will be more appropriate because they all play to different strengths. So we have homed in on these three 
at Manchester. None are very good, actually. So we think it's best to have, as I say, a basket. The first of these, which is the Shanghai Shaotong, doesn't cover humanities very well. And the third one, the QS ranking, um, uses bibliometrics and reputation surveys. The second is very complex and pretends to include teaching, but not very well. So you can see, you can see the issue. The important thing, though, we feel is to be able to isolate the things in these, um, in these rankings, the uh, indicators in these rankings, and do our best to influence the outcomes. So whereas we may not be able to, in fact, we certainly can't influence uh, how many Nobel laureates we have amongst our alumni, we can influence the performance of our nearly highly cited researchers, for example. So that's where effort will go in the future, on bringing on those, those people. <coughs> I'm going to just deviate slightly here, but it's, it's important because I have mentioned these highly cited researchers, and given the audience, I think it's relevant. You'll see here that um, this, that you may know that Thomson Reuters in uh, 2014, so last year, um, produced a new version of the highly cited researchers um, list. And this is important to us because it is included in the Shanghai Shaotong Index. In total, over 3,200 highly cited researchers are included on this list. It doesn't sound all that many, and it's half the number, I think, of, of previous, um, list, the previous list. Um, they're, they're banded around 20, 21 broad subjects and subject categories, and researchers are classified as highly cited within those categories. Now, you'll see from this slide that, with the exception of Edinburgh, Manchester is not doing so great. Actually. So we, are, we will now use this. The library, in fact, will uh, do an analysis or is, is involved in doing an analysis to identify those eight highly cited researchers, but also to find those who come close. And that's, that will enable us to put more effort towards, towards those, to give support in, in the right way, to enable those people to make it and to increase the number on that table next time. So that was a, a quick deviation from this list because if I skip on two slides, there are, of course, many other rankings, league tables, and we've looked at all of these, and if you're really interested in this, then um, Luke Georgiou, who isn't here, um, has written quite extensively about, about these. And I thought I'd just touch on... Um, some of the pros and cons, but without taking too much time. Um, well, first of all, to tell you that um, of, of these tables, there's, there's almost not quite one for every country, but everyone's having a go at this. Um, it's an industry all of its own, and you only have to dig a little bit, and you will find much, uh, many publications about the pros and cons of, of these. Um, we have one from University of Western Australia. The first one here is a, a Taiwanese ranking, then we have a Russian one, the third one, Leiden we know, um, Saimago of course is Spain and Portugal, and then we've got the French one, and following that we've got, where does that one come from, anybody know, the web, web, metric, web metrics, it's Spanish. Spanish, thank you, it is, yeah. And then the last one is a European Commission one. So that's, to, I suppose, just to give you a sense of um, the complexity of all of this and, and the, um, the challenges. To, to illustrate the point a little further, I'm going to show you the, the, the three, the basket of three indicators that Manchester have chosen. So that's the um, Shanghai Jiao Tong, the Times Higher, and the QS. And you'll see that we're in different positions in each one. So we're 38th in the first of those. We're 52nd in the next one. 
and the one I really like, we're, we're 30th. <laughs> um, as I said, all of these receive criticism, but to say a little bit about the, um, the strengths and weaknesses of them, um, the first, the, the, the Times Higher, is of course the most respected table. It's in, internationally comprehensible in terms of its indicators, and they are reasonably simple. It is, though, the downside is it's based solely on quantitative indicators of research performance and esteem, um, no indication of performance in other areas of institutional mission like teaching and learning, knowledge transfer, and so on. And no account is taken of input indicators like research income, research training, and so on. Um, I'm worried about time. Am I, how am I doing? Can I? Oh, great, thanks. Sorry, <laughs> nearly lunchtime. Um, moving on to the second of these, so where have I got to? This, this one. This is the Times Higher ranking. Uh, the indicators, as, you, as some of you may know, citation impact is important in here. This is the normalized average citation per paper. It includes research volume, so the number of papers per academic, income and reputation by peer survey. You can already sense there's a potential weakness there. Teaching and learning, reputational survey, PhD awards per academic, undergraduate submitted per academic, income per academic, and the international mix, the ratio of international to domestic staff. So there's some, some strengths, of course, the diverse range of quantitative and qualitative data covering multiple aspects of institutional mission are in there. So that's a, that's a strength over the first one. Um, there's substantial involvement of institutions in data collection, which is seen as positive, rather than um, something totally lacking in transparency. And a wide consultation over the selection and weighting of indicators. The downside of these is that the reputational survey um, is, is bound to be unreliable, I suppose. It has, it has those components. And it's prone to uh, an Anglo-centricity and a bias uh, and open to manipulation, I think. There's a lot of game playing around all of this, of course. Income indicators on this one are hard to compare cross-nationally due to different contexts for different countries. Substantial bibliometric components have substantial black box of complex methodology. In other words, it's really hard to unpick and understand why you got where you got. Very hard to, to replicate. And of course, you may have heard of the the story of um, Alexandria. You know, it's possible to uh, self-cite, get, get your citations up. Uh, the 2010 rankings contain a number of counterintuitive outcomes like that. So you can get skewed bibliometric indicators. Alexandria, Turkey, there was an example there. Uh, in the upper echelon, they, they got into the upper echelons um, of, the, of the tables through a very small volume of highly cited work. It's, it, it's possible to do that. I think they had one or two members of staff involved, actually, um, but some of you will know more of this than I do. So that gives you an idea, and then I, I think I won't go into detail on the third because it, it, it starts to sound repetitive, but um, the indicators are around academic peer review. Um, again, by international reputational survey, um, faculty staff to student ratio is important in this one, citations per faculty, international orientation. So why do people not like these, these league tables? What are, the, um, what are the limitations of them? Well, there is a whole industry, as I've said. A very considerable literature now exists around this and the whole phenomenon of, of rankings. There are some positive aspects, of, as we heard this morning. Um, these help us to um, identify people that we want to attract to our institutions and also um, to uh, attract students um, and to, to, to generally uh, sort of 
use them uh, to, to increase our resources. You know, it, it's possible that a country would invest more in a, uh, in, in a university system that was not doing well in the ranking. So there are some clear advantages to these approaches. So why are they so unpopular? Well, first of all, I, I've, I've kind of grouped these under four headings, and uh, data is, is a key one. There's a lack of international comparability across um, the, the kinds of things that are being measured, the indicators. A lack of transparency and reproducibility. Ranking organizations, organizations rarely reveal what they've, what they've taken and how they've used how they've calculated the, um, their findings. Indicators, another, another issue. Most rankings use citation data, as we know, but there are problems with accuracy. Spelling, for example, bias, treatment of co-authors. But it is part of academic life now, certainly for us, and uh, I, I think we have to do our best to work with, with the system. Citations, of course, don't measure research quality directly. They, they measure impact, as we, as we said earlier. Moving on then, aggregation, another, another area um, for discussion. The ranking tables include institutions with very diverse missions. And not even, we're not really even comparing apples and pears. We're comparing apples and armchairs, for example. And then the whole governance of all of this. Ranking organizations are self-appointed. They're often commercial organizations. And the majority use the rankings to support those operations. So they may offer consultancy on the back of, of their work, analytical services. Credibility has been diminished, I think, by the proliferation of these tables and the disputes between the ranking organizations. So now, that was, that was mainly around the international rankings, I just want to say something about national uh, competition, national rankings. And you'll know that um, the UK, um, for many years, as we saw in Keith's presentation this morning, the UK has used what was called the research, um, the RAE, the research, God, I've almost forgotten what it stands for now. Um, assessment exercise, thank you. I've, I've so switched my brain to the new one, which is the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, which um, featured for the first time in our lives last year. This is still, though, a means of allocating our university block grant income. So it's a big deal. In fact, I'd say it's a bigger deal than where we are in the rankings. It's about the amount of money we bring in in order to do more research. It's based on peer assessment of, of quality and a quality of research. It's comprised, or, or the work is carried out by 36 discipline panels. In 2014, we saw 190,000 research outputs and 7,000 impact cases. You see what I mean about an industry. And 52,000 faculty were, uh, took part from 154 institutions. Assessment is based on quantitative indicators, inclu including bibliometrics, of course, and light touch expert review. Um, and I wanted to just home in on three elements of, of that um, assessment. Uh, we talk about a, a quality profile, and I've put on the slide there the three features of that profile. Research outputs make up 65%. Impact indicators make up 20%, and the research environment itself makes up 15 So research outputs you'll, you'll be familiar with. Academics or faculty uh, normally submit four, if they have four, four publications, and, um, and then they're, 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 they're judged on, on that. Impact, which is a new one for us, um, includes reach and significance, importance to the economy, society, culture, and there is definitely, if I can mention libraries, there's a role here in terms of helping people to write their impact case studies, also in terms of purchasing the materials that relate to these and altmetrics. And then the third one here, the research environment, is all about um, strategies for supporting and promoting and developing research in our institutions. 
So it's about the equipment, the facilities, the libraries, um, the, the whole infrastructure, and also the PhD numbers and completions of those. Okay. Then what happens is that um, those uh, subject panels, the, the discipline panels, um, assess the, the work of those academics and award stars. It's very simple, very basic. They, they award stars. And all units, basically, all discipline units with three star or more receive funding from this exercise. So the, the, again, league tables start to creep in, but now we're on a national level because um, an institution will have a grade point average for its discipline and for, and for the whole university that can form a league table. And indeed, also, we talk about um, research power. That has become um, very important uh, since the introduction of the REF. So this is about the volume, so the number of people submitting to the REF multiplied by their, their scores, those scores. Um, I've mentioned there's a lot of game playing, um, but we're now living with the consequences of, of last year's REF. So what happened at Manchester, given that this is the case study I'm trying to focus on? Well, 83% of our research activity was deemed four-star world leading or three-star internationally excellent. I'm pleased to say that we were fifth in terms of research power or market share from, from fourth, actually, last time. And 4% fall, I'm afraid I'm not so pleased to say, in absolute terms. I'll say a bit more about that. Our rivals are um, largely increasing their efforts, of course. So it would be very easy if everybody else stood still and we just put in masses of effort, but of course that doesn't happen. So our competitors are doing better and our, our effort has to, has to sharpen. So there are significant um, funding implications of this. We have, we have lost about 12 million pounds as a result of our, our results um, in the REF. Um, and you'll see there, I've put in a bullet there around University College London. They increased by 48% as a result of, guess what, more mergers. So they have brought in several other institutions and it's, and it's boosted their performance hugely. And you'll see there, I'm not going to stay on this slide too long, it's not very comfortable, but um, we, have, uh, we have moved from 6th to 14th in grade point average. So I said it's a success story, but almost. It's not good enough yet, and we still need a step change. And I just want to tell you what we're doing to, to, to make those changes now. It, we're in 2015, and uh, what what we will do to improve our performance next time. These are the elements of a new strategy for research quality that is being rolled out now in the university. First of all, a statement of expectations for all academic staff, all faculty. Staff with experience at world-leading universities tell us that other places they've worked have much higher expectations of their performance. So we're going to start cracking the whip a bit harder. There'll be a, top, a much more top-down approach to all of this. We will expect all research active staff to, sorry, we would expect all research staff, I should say, to produce a minimum of four, four three-star outputs next time we go through the REF in five years' time and to plan for at least one four-star. And as I've said, we need to identify the people who are not going to get there and, and do our best to support them. So a much more, I suppose, a much more hands-on look at the performance five years before the next REF. Accountability for quality. International research review will be recalibrated. So, so sorry, internal research review. So um, we run every, through each year, we run our own dummy runs at these exercises. And... These will um, be recalibrated and used uh, to performance manage our, our academics. 
And then moving on to developing new talent, it's, it's kind of no-brainer that we should be bringing in new, new people. We need to attract and in, invest in the best independent fellows, and a substantial part of volume increase in our rivals has come from, exactly, from doing exactly that. Our expectations will extend most probably to postgraduate researchers. Theses should support at least one three-star output, for example. So a thesis on its own is, is not enough. Lead supervisors must have three-star outputs themselves, or you can't do it, can't do the job. And appraisals or performance reviews, depending on what you call them, will address research career elements. So paper writing skills, conference and social network, prizes, panel memberships, and review experience will all be taken into account at the time of the annual appraisal. And then finally, supporting research leaders, really important, ensuring those producing top-level outputs get a disproportionate share of research time. So if that's where you're putting your effort, we will reward you by giving you more time. And, and less time possibly for teaching or administration. We'll focus support on the, the second decile of staff capable of moving to research leadership. And we'll continue to target research leaders for recruitment. And to just reassure you and make myself feel a little bit better maybe, because I feel I've been quite candid with you, um, we're already um, on our way with this. We've seen a major upturn in the last two years because, of course, although 2014 was only last year, the work was done prior to that. Our citations are up, research income is up, our research awards are up, and our share of the Research Council UK awards have gone up. Um, so it, it's, it's starting to look um, much better. And our, our, we have a capital program on campus. We're spending another billion pounds to close the original UMIST campus. So you remember right at the beginning I talked about the merger. We will close that campus and concentrate everything on the former Victoria University campus. So big investment is going on um, around this. And that is everything I wanted to say. And there I promised you some References, I'm sure you don't want to scribble them down, but you can have the slides. Thank you very much.